These are hyped to be the next big thing after smartphones. Gadgets so small and light, you could wear them 24-7 on your body. They're fashionably known as... Wearables. Wearable. Wearables. Watches, eyewear, smart teeth. Almost anybody will be wearing one of these which is monitoring their health, their vital signs. Your doctor is able to keep a close eye on you. We're actually able to see a lot more in the data. Predicting diseases that you may not have yet. That could be quite critical in saving a person's life. The promise of wearables is huge. Every latest wearable device out there is fancier and cooler than the previous one that came out. I'll give you that much. But it seems to me that you're still doing the same old boring You know, like tracking steps and getting your heart rate. And maybe they've got a bunch of other functions that I don't use. My question is, what happened to all those life-changing features that we were once promised? I know what you're thinking. What does this guy know about the future? That's the thing. I'm no expert. That's why I've signed up for this job. Oh boy. I feel like I'm giving birth to aliens. Three, two, one. Oh, there you go. Right there. <laughs> wow. Digital resurrection. Digital biomarkers. Future engineering. GM manipulations. Organ on the chip. If all these buzzwords are supposed to change the way we live forever, I want to be in on that conversation. To find out exactly what's the big deal. Remember this from 2013? The ultra futuristic Google Glass. OK, Glass. Take a picture. Ah, see, it's all of you. Nice. So it seems like uh, the primary use for something like this would be to take creepy pictures of your Tinder date. So I'm not surprised this didn't take off. Because of its cosmic price tag, yet no video. clarity on how such a product may be useful, Google Glass was taken off the market yeah. after just two years. But the hype over wearable technology kept going. You know, when these devices first came out, it is true that people were buying them. But a 2016 study showed that about a third of them stopped using these products within the first six months. But tech companies are still investing. For example, Apple, the R&D budget was just $1 billion in 2009, but they increased it to $19 billion in 2019. I think there's a, almost a universal agreement that uh, devices that are closer to our bodies, that's where the next big thing's going to be. So, uh, Doc, I see you're wearing a smartwatch. Is that for, you know, tracking your steps and keeping fit? Actually, no. I'm just using the watch to tell the time and also to look at the photo of my wife. <laughs> this way, please. Seems kind of strange that Dr. Yo is grossly underusing his wearable device because he is the CEO of a startup dealing with cutting edge wearable sensors. So, for today, you are just going to help us sew a sensor onto this fabric. Sew? Yes. That's right. I'm quite good at that. You know, I come from a family of dealers, actually. Fantastic. But where is the sensor? You can see the sensor just right here. This is the sensor? Yes. I thought this was some extra thread I was going to throw in the dustbin. <laughs> we developed a new method of fabricating microfiber sensors, which can be sewed directly onto your fabrics that you wear today. Okay. And it's machine washable as well, so you can wash it like your normal fabric. My job is to stitch this sensor into this piece of fabric. How is something like this more effective than the sensor in my smartwatch, for example? 
So the sensors in the smartwatch are usually rigid devices and because it's rigid, you will not be able to cover such a big surface area, especially for body parts. For uh, sensors like ours, you can sew a lot of sensors uh, within the same surface area, which allows us to capture more data. It allows us to know not just the body movements, but how your muscles behave when you do specific movements. In other words, Dr. Yeo's sensors can measure even minute contractions in our muscles to tell us how hard they're working. Hello. Hey, what's up, guys? And that's why they came up with the Ares Band, a prototype armband packed with their microfiber sensors that can track how effective your strength yeah. training session has been. This band. Oh, wow. We can start the workout. Okay. We're doing a bench press? Yes, a bench press. Okay. Cool. At the end of the session, the band will rate the effectiveness of my workout out of 100 okay. marks. That's based on how consistent and stable I am in oh, yeah. pumping out yeah. these reps. So this is a result from your... 45 marks out of 100. <laughs> Why are my results so lousy? According to the recommendation, it will ask you to work on your training form. But I've been working with my trainer for close to a year and he never brought this up, right? Because, you know, we would watch your form and tell you, OK, whether your form is correct or wrong. So why is this more accurate than a professional trainer, for example? So your trainer is probably using like an eyeball technique to check out your um, workout form. And this is probably based on intuitions or feelings instead of hard, concrete, objective numbers. The band has not hit the market yet. But the team is trialling the band with gym goers at Carvo Fitness. It will be used in a monthly strength test for their members. My honest thoughts, it does give you specific numbers, but what do I do with it? How do I improve it? So you don't have someone telling you these things, then it just demoralises you, unfortunately. So, I do own a smartwatch. And this is all the data it has collected on me since I started wearing it about two years ago. So here's what I've realised. The wearables available in the market have succeeded in giving us more accurate and precise numbers about our health. Maybe it's time someone told me, what the hell am I supposed to do with all these numbers? Okay, look, full disclosure, I kind of underutilize my smartwatch. I mainly put it on for cardio sessions or to complete my outfit of the day. Even so, since the year I've started wearing it, my smartwatch has collected half a million data points of health metrics. But really, what can all these numbers tell me? To find out, I've sent the data set to Dr. Tsar from Li Kongqian School of Medicine. His research team is developing algorithms to mine health data of individuals, like myself, for patterns that may reveal hidden health conditions. We look at the data that devices passively collect about us. So this data is incredibly personal and profiles you. I just surrendered two years' worth of health data to you before we started talking. Unfortunately, you have not shared enough data. How is it insufficient? I'm confused. What we see from your data is that you have been wearing the watch fairly irregularly. We should really wear this device close to 24 hours a day. So I don't wear it to sleep uh, because you know, typically it's just not as comfortable. You really need to see the trade-offs of the comfort of developing new habits with the amazing opportunities that this brings take care of our health rather than waiting to fall ill and then do something about our health. So there has been a big push by the government towards preventive health. A huge erase power by wearables. There has been a lot of work that has shown new insights coming from wearable devices to predict um, emerging disease. 
well before you might see symptoms or well before it might even show up in your lab tests. The wearables of today can do a lot of great things for your health. But like anything that's good for your health, you are the one who's going to have to put in the time and the effort. You can't be lazy about it. Like in my case, I'm going to have to wear my smartwatch to sleep even, just so I can give Dr. Za enough data. You know how troublesome that's going to be? I'm going to keep up the habit for two weeks and then go back to Dr. Zar with the data. While he's going to interpret data that is mostly behavioural, things like how hard I exercise, how well I sleep, how active I am day to day, medical interest in wearables doesn't quite stop there. Researchers are pushing to see if mainstream wearables can even capture information that you used to be able to only tell through a blood test, like blood glucose or hormone levels. This video was taken in a lab in South Korea. These smart contact lenses can read your blood glucose levels and are said to be as accurate as medical devices. They are so cutting edge, more rabbits than humans have worn them at this point. And that's why my crew and I are heading to the city of Poha, on the east coast of South Korea. Why did you decide to use rabbits? As you may know, rabbits have uh, the similar diameter of eye with the human eye. I didn't know that. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning that now. Okay, so, great. Have you tried it on humans yet? Yes. After checking the safety of our smart contact lenses, we carried out clinical tests for humans. For safety reasons, the only humans approved to wear the lenses at this moment are members of the research team. Yep, this guy. But the team will move on to human trials in 2023 and hopefully roll the product out commercially in a few years' time. So how does it work now that it's in his eye? If we put this device into your eyes, the data is transmitted to our smartphones. There is a strong correlation between tear glucose levels and the blood glucose levels. So if we measure the tear glucose levels, we can estimate the real blood glucose levels. These lenses are an attractive alternative to the glucometer, which is the conventional way of monitoring blood glucose levels. Great news for diabetics who would probably be happy to ditch the painful needles. But Dr. Han also hopes that his smart contact lenses can be used as a pain-free option for healthy individuals who want to monitor themselves for early signs of diabetes. And what do you see is the future of uh, this smart lens? People say that eyes are the window of the soul, but I can say that eyes can be used for disease monitoring. So eyes are connected to the brain, heart, lung, and kidney, so can reflect the symptoms of diseases in our body. So our smart contact lens can be used for the monitoring of various diseases in the body. The team hopes to make use of tears as a proxy to reveal a person's body chemistry, and especially if there are any abnormalities which could indicate some kind of disease. You go to the doctor every few months, get certain tests, and he takes a snapshot of your health at that moment in time. Wearables promises to sort of reverse that and capture your health every day, day to day. Understanding not just your daily health, but also your emotion at any time. Now, you might think that I'm really calm, but the truth is, I'm not. Ooh because it's only our second day of filming here in Korea and we're in the middle of a typhoon. Now, as an actor, I'm trained to conceal my true feelings all the time. But what if I told you that there was someone developing a technology that could read your true feelings and that the FBI wants it?
Mm. I'm now in a lab in Kaist, one of Korea's top research universities. And I'm watching horror movies. In the name of science, of course. See the gentleman watching over me just a little bit creepily. That's Dr. Cho. He's been working on these sensors for 12 years now. I'm told some of these sensors do not exist in your regular smartwatches yet. Wow, Doc, so this is how you welcome your guests, showing them scary movies? <laughs> is that what it's supposed <laughs> yeah. to be? So I can see that we've got some uh, sensors underneath the tape. Yeah, underneath your skin, we have uh, small patches. They contain the sweat sensors, Mm -hmm. and the skin temperature sensors mm -hmm. and pulse wave sensors, as well as uh, the goosebump sensors. Did you say goosebump? Yes. May I interrupt for a short refresher in biology? Thank you. Goosebumps happen when tiny muscles in our hair follicles flex, causing our hair to stand. We can't control it with our mind. This is a purely involuntary response. So it can happen when we feel powerful emotions, such as fear, shock, anxiety, and sometimes even inspiration. When we are measuring things like uh, sweat, uh, skin temperature, and pulse rate, and goosebumps, what are we trying to find out with all this information? By measuring those kind of uh, bias signals, we can major your emotional status or mental status, such as fears, stresses. Oh, that's why you got me to watch all those scary right. clips. Oh. So this is how it all works. The combination of your pulse rate, skin temperature, and sweat can reveal your stress level. And your goosebumps reveal whether you are feeling strong emotions, such as fear or inspiration at that point. So, if you can't tell by my face that I was scared, these graphs don't lie, in theory. So, you're trying to gather this information to measure my mood and my emotion? Right. That's all very personal stuff, Doctor. I mean, I only write it in my diary normally. So, how accurate is this information? At present, this is about 60 to 70 percent labor. This is pretty high, actually. So one day, uh, this could kind of go into a smartwatch. Sure. Who would find this information useful? We are going to apply this technology to the call center's employees' uh, stress monitoring. This sensor is attached to your headset. So a call center employees receive a lot of uh, mental stresses. It's a stressful job. Right. Yeah. But at present, there is no method to measure their mental stresses objectively. How do they measure stress? Currently, uh, people asking that, is there any person who got a stress? They raise a hand. <laughs> then the manager allows them to take some rest. That's uh, quite subjective. Mm. So we need some proper method to major stress level objectively. What about the information about uh, emotion and, and mood and fears? Who mm -hmm. would find that useful? Actually, FBI shows some interest. The FBI? Yes. They uh, ask about the goosebump sensor as a lie detector. So you're saying that the, uh, the current polygraph test, the lie detector test, mm -hmm. is in inaccurate because the people may cheat it. People cannot change the goosebump Why? intentionally. How come? Because, because the goosebump is a natural basic instinct. So are we saying that people get goosebumps when they are telling lies? Yes, if people are lying, they have some fears. You can tell when I'm lying, you can tell when I'm fearful. That makes me feel very vulnerable. But on this trip to South Korea, I have worn my wearable everywhere, including to bed, as I promised I would to Dr. Czar back in Singapore. And I'm bringing him more than 300 hours of data collected by my wearable. While Dr. Czar hopes to develop algorithms to detect all kinds of chronic health conditions, currently the most successful one he has, the Y-Cogni model, 
can detect depression with 80% accuracy. And these digital biomarkers are um, telling something about ourselves, about our bodies. Can they tell us something about our mental well-being? And as it turns out, they can. So before we go into that yes. reveal, does that mean that whatever you've seen is going to tell the patient, yes, you have mental well-being challenges? Whatever instruments we have, they never make a diagnosis. Diagnosis is always made by a, a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. You are very clear about this, that this is not a, a replacement of your, your physician or, or, or your doctor. This is a, an, an aid. So what does the model say about my data? Well, uh, Rishi, first thing I would say, it's such a pleasure to be with you on the show. <laughs> wow, this feels uh, like a breakup. <laughs> There are many caveats to interpretation in terms of model is under development, needs further validation. Based on all of those limitations, the data does suggest that you might be depressed. How does the model come to this conclusion that, you know, someone might be depressed? There are over 200 digital biomarkers which we explored things such as energy expenditure, like physical activity. We know that all of those change as someone develops depression. You know? As the doc rattles on about these different biomarkers, I'm just thinking, hey doc, come on, tell me already, exactly which part of my data showed that I might be depressed? Because to me, nothing in my data stood out. Sleep looks okay, Activity data looks okay, but after a while, it hit me. I can only focus on small individual parts of the data, but an algorithm can process a lot more data and spot subtle patterns in the bigger picture that a human being like me would probably miss out on. One day, an algorithm like that can be pushed out as an app that I could download and potentially catch a health condition before it causes me any problems in my daily life. And that, well, that's a big deal. The good news is, after filming concluded, I paid a visit to my therapist and uh, I'm glad to say that things are positive. Nothing to worry about. But I think it's still a good idea for me to leave my wearable on because, you know, who knows, this little buddy of mine could one day give me an early warning sign that might be useful to my health.